uh, net, uh, uh, this is, I've called this uh, fact and fiction because there's, there's a lot of uh, misinformation out there about uh, neuroendocrine tumours. I'm sure all of you have found uh, during your various uh, journeys through this disease. Um, the first fact is that uh, net is difficult to diagnose. And, and many of you will have had delayed diagnoses. The fiction is that they're rare. They're not nearly as rare, and the fact that there's so many of you in this room shows that they're not as rare as people think. The symptoms associated with NET are really commonplace, and therefore it's really difficult to diagnose them often. If you look at just carcinoid syndrome, all of the symptoms around the inner circle are what are associated with carcinoid syndrome, but they're also associated with all the diseases and all the diagnoses on the outside <coughs> ring. And so often uh, when patients present to their GP, their family physician, they diagnose with one of those more common things on the outer ring rather than the, the, the carcinoid uh, tumour which is on the inner ring. And that often leads to a lot of anger uh, in, in patients and their families and often directed to yourself, why was I so stupid? not to know that I had this disease. You know, why did I think that it was normal to have seven bowel actions a day? You know, why did I think flushing was uh, just, just me? Uh, and so you have to be gentle on yourself and to some extent on your doctor because your doctors have a hard uh, task in, in general practice land uh, dealing with common symptoms. Is it, is it rare? You, this is a graph of the growth in neuroendocrine tumours in the United States over the last 20 years. You can see, although uh, cancer is increasing slightly uh, as we have an ageing population, neuroendocrine tumours are, are growing much more rapidly than that. Uh, is that just better diagnosis? Well, CT and, and, and MRI have been around all that time. Pathology has been good in the United States, so we don't think it's just better recognition. It's, it's probably a real phenomenon. And this is happening everywhere in the world um, in, in the post-war era. This is data from uh, Taiwan where uh, across all neuroendocrine tumours there's a, a significant increase uh, in the, uh, uh, how common this is in the population. This is seen in Vietnam, in India, in China, in Japan. Um, in the USA it's now the second only to colon cancer in terms of people living with a diagnosis of gastrointestinal cancer. It's more common than pancreatic or stomach cancer in terms of people living with it, and that's because people live with it for a long time. Fact, most neuroendocrine tumours grow slowly. Fiction is you die with rather than from net. Many people will tell you, don't worry about it, it's not a serious cancer, you won't die of it, you'll, you'll, you'll live for a long time. The reality is that unfortunately, most people, when it's spread, if it can't be resected and cured by initial surgery, most patients will unfortunately die of their neuroendocrine tumour. And I often describe it for our Australian patients who this uh, uh, metaphor uh, works better for is it's like mistletoe in the gum tree. The, the mistletoe leaf and the gum leaf look very much the same. Uh, and both those trees there have mistletoe in them. One's a healthy gum tree that's only got a little bit of uh, mistletoe in it, just, just sitting there, uh, and a few other pieces around the place. And this one uh, has been weakened because the tree surgeon got in there and tried to cut out all the, the mistletoe and, and weakened the tree, and the tree then, unfortunately, died, uh, and the mistletoe died with it. And so uh, these neuroendocrine cells are very like normal cells. They, they look alike. They behave alike, uh, but they can kill, uh, just like mistletoe in a gum tree. NED is often, unfortunately, diagnosed late, and that's because it's very slowly growing. It, uh, the body accommodates it. You don't get the acute pain that you get from a rapidly growing tumour. Uh, and the symptoms from hormone secretion don't tend to appear until late, uh, particularly with carcinoid syndrome, because the liver clears the serotonin that's secreted by the small bowel and lymph nodes in, in, the, in the abdomen, uh, it's cleared before it enters into the general circulation. It's only when the tumour spread to the liver and the serotonin can escape into the general circulation that symptoms occur. And so there can be this very long lag time between the onset of the tumour in, in a location like the, the, the small bowel uh, and its uh, manifestations as a, as a, a card-carrying cancer. 
And that slow uh, growth uh, means also that they tend to resist conventional therapies, the ones that Sharon spoke about. Chemotherapy, radiotherapy tend to work much better when cells are actively dividing uh, than growing. Uh, when they're slowly growing, they tend to be very resistant. And so uh, the tools that we use as, as cancer doctors are uh, often very ineffective uh, in, in these very slowly growing tumours. The next fact is that no net is the same. And as you talk to each other, you'll find that all of your diseases are very different in their manifestations, how quickly they've grown, how they've responded to treatment. That's true. But it's not true that there's no way to predict the outcome. We have a lot of information from a large number of patients followed over a long period of time that gives us clues about how a tumour might behave over time. The important things, most important things we've found is the extent of disease. If it's localised, they do well. If they're systemic, they've spread, they do much worse. Uh, Sharon introduced you to the concept of grade. The more aggressively they're growing, generally the worse the outlook is for those particular tumours. And they currently go in three grades, it's soon be four. Um, but uh, the higher the grade, the worse the out outcome. But within each of those grades, there's a whole lot of other things which are important. For example, where your tumour started. If it uh, arose in your uh, rectum, the outlook is much worse than if it arose in your uh, small bowel. They're both in the gut, but their outcome is very different. Pancreas is different, again, from, from colon or appendix. Uh, all the patients in the stage four, the bottom curve on the top, have spread of their disease to somewhere else in the body where it shouldn't be. But how much there is also determines how long someone is likely to live. The more, the larger the bulk of disease, obviously, the worse it is. Some sites of metastatic disease have a different outlook than others. Bone different to liver, different to lymph nodes, even though they might be remote sites of disease. And the last important thing is, is how well you respond to the treatments you get. If you're very responsive, you might live much longer than someone who, who fails to respond. One of the challenges that we face in talking about NET is that it starts from a point of diversity. There are 14 different cells from which this tumour can arise. So from the get-go, it's a whole lot of different tumours. Some of them go under different names because of the hormones they secrete in the cell from which they arise. Gastronomas, insulinomas, glucagonomas, uh, carcinoids, ferrochromosomes, they, they have fancy names. And this uh, reflects the different cells of origin and the different functions of those cells. Uh, and we have to recognise that some produce hormones that cause syndromes uh, and others are not functional at all. They just grow like cancers. And this is confusing for doctors, let alone patients. And often when I go and talk to doctors, I have to educate them about the different types of, of neuroendocrine tumours. But we, we try and make it simple. We, we call them all NET or neuroendocrine tumour or neuroendocrine neoplasia increasingly. Sharon introduced you to the, to the, the one thing that tends to unify them, the, the net puts them under one category, uh, but the unifying feature of most of these tumours, not all of them, is that they have the somatostatin receptor and uh, uh, the somatos is body in Greek and, and, and status is stop, and so you've got the body stop it's the off switch of these cells, and there's five different varieties of them, and they're like a revolving door that takes somatostatin or octreotide uh, analogs, the somatostatin analogs, into the cell to deliver a message to stop it doing whatever it's doing. That includes growing or producing hormones, and if you have a revolving door, you need a key. And the key here uh, for us to deliver stuff into the cell uh, are the peptides. Uh, we have key rings, which we call collating agents. They're not terribly interesting. Uh, and then we have some more interesting stuff, the dangly bits. Uh, the dang and they're the radioisotopes that we hang off these peptides. And uh, we use these to diagnose them. You most of you have heard of a GATATE scan. The target here is the somatostatin receptor, which is overexpressed in about 90% of all neuroendocrine tumours. Uh, and it's um, uh, a characteristic feature of those. Uh, this type of imaging started with something called Indium-111 
DTPA octreotide or octrea scans, uh, and they uh, what were initially approved. In fact, I did the first one in Australia in 1991. Uh, we introduced it into Australia uh, back then. It's a, it's a very old scan. We hardly ever use it now uh, because there's a much better scan, which uh, we call GATATE because it takes the dangly bit, the GA uh, from gallium, uh, and the TATE from the peptide, GATATE. Some people call it a DOTA scan, which is calling it like the key ring. I don't think that's very interesting. Uh, and other people call it a DOTA TATE scan, or, and, it, and its trade name is now NETSWAT. It's going to be approved, in the, it's just been approved in the United States, uh, a new invention uh, for the United States to have introduced this new te technique in the last year or two. Uh, the, um, the one that's available here, I gather, uh, mainly is this one called Technetium Hynek Octreotide, a tectroid scan. Sounds, sounds very technologically advanced, but sorry, they're horrible scans. <laughs> and I think they're expensive too, aren't they? Uh, I think they might be more expensive than getting scan, but it's the Right. Good. This is the evolution of, of, of imaging. Uh, and the, the patient on the left, and the, or the scan on the left and the right, is actually the same patient. Uh, but this is, it represents the evolution of this, this scan uh, technique over the years from uh, a two-dimensional phasey image that people call unclear medicine, uh, nuclear medicine, uh, just reversing the letters slightly, uh, became unclear medicine. Uh, and this the patient was thought to have a solitary site of disease up here uh, in the neck, the lower part of the neck. And this, this is the GATATE scan done uh, about three days later. Uh, and you can see, um, in fact, un unfortunately for the patient, uh, that they had very widespread disease, which was completely unrecognised. This, this is the, the evolution in the technology from something that is very insensitive to something that's exquisitely sensitive, and that has a, a major impact on the outcome of these patients. Um, the, the important thing here is that this patient was going to have surgery to remove that lymph node, which obviously wasn't a sensible thing to, to do. And we looked at this very early on when we introduced GATATE imaging uh, to work out how often a more sensitive and specific scan would change management. And surprise, surprise, it does it a lot. 47% uh, of patients, we change the treatment plan from either surgery to not surgery or different kind of surgery from surgery to systemic therapy or from uh, active treatment to surveillance on the basis of, of the scan. So it really has a major impact on, on the care of patients. And that's because it's a winner in what I call a lumpology state. It finds many more lumps than uh, conventional imaging. But it does more than that. It tells us about the biology, and, and as Sharon alluded to this. If we look at um, uh, GATATE, it's certainly the best test for, for net, but it's not the only test. That, uh, when I started doing this, and often I'd go to international meetings and talk about our experience with using FDG PET, they said it has no role. It's a useless test. And the reason they said that is this pair of scans in the typical patient with neuroendocrine tumour that shows lots and lots of lumps in the liver here and a cluster of lymph nodes down in the abdomen there. Uh, but in this patient, the FDG shows absolutely nothing, no sites of disease. So on the lumpology stakes, FDG is a very bad scan here. We don't see any of the disease. But here's another patient who in fact has uh, one of those G3 tumours up here at this end. And we see lots of lumps all over the place and nothing on the GATATE scan. Which is good if you're looking at, at GATATE. Uh, it's really good in the low grade ones and not so good in the high grade ones. And uh, the FDG is the opposite. Not so good in the low grade ones, but very good in the high grade ones. But it took me almost 10 years to find patients who had exclusively scans that were positive on one and negative on the other, because it almost never happens. They, they're usually a mixture of both. And what does it mean if we look at these 
Kaplan Meyer curves again that, uh, that Sharon nicely explained to you. If you have a low grade tumour and you look at it on, on somatostatin receptor imaging, the, the percentage of patients who have a positive scan falls as grade increases. But a positive scan there carries a good outlook. You're going to do better. On the other hand, the trend is the opposite here. FDG becoming more likely to be positive as the grade increases. Uh, and that carries a bad outlook in comparison. But you can see 87% are positive down here and 41. That means there's a lot of overlap of these patients. What does it look like if you've got both? The most important thing about these functional images, it tells us about therapeutic targets. And this is the concept of theranostics, where we can change the dangly bit uh, on, on the, the peptide to deliver therapy. So we can use a diagnostic tracer to scan, and then we can use a targeted therapy, giving off a, uh, a particle that, that treats. So it's combining molecular imaging for diagnosis and a targeted therapeutic that gives off a, a radionuclide uh, um, particle uh, to give the right therapy to the right patient at the right time. And this is uh, really what happens. The revolving door comes out, the uh, isotope goes in and smashes DNA, uh, which is the body's um, uh, or the cell's genetic code that tells it how to function, how to grow, and, and is necessary for its effective di division. As I've, I've shown you, uh, there is this um, uh, reduction in the likelihood of a somatostatin uh, scan, the GATATE scan being positive, as grade increases. It's very high in the low grade ones and it tends to decrease. The opposite occurs uh, with the FDG. Some of these low grade ones can be FDG positive, uh, but as they become uh, um, more aggressive, the vast majority of them become positive. And so we have these overlapping curves. Down here, uh, these are ones that are just showing somatostatin receptors and just having, uh, and having no uh, FDG uptake. They're the ones that most people think you should be treating with peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. Obviously, these patients up here who are only FDG, who don't have the somatostatin receptor, can't be treated. Uh, we actually think the sweet spot, the best spot uh, to treat these patients are the patients who have both, have FDG uptake and a, a somatostatin positive because we know that the uh, FDG avid component carries a bad prognosis, so patients are most likely to benefit from treatment, uh, but also they're more actively growing and more actively growing cells are more sensitive to the effects of radiation and therefore more likely to respond. And so we've, we've deliberately colorized in this way that the green light don't, don't need to think about it terribly much. You can go ahead, uh, red, stop, uh, and the amber light, uh, proceed with caution. But feels good to get through an amber light, doesn't it? <laughs> Particularly if there's a flash just after you've, you, you've gone. Uh, I don't, do you have red light cameras here? <laughs> we have lots, lots of red light cameras, particularly in, in the suburbs where I take my kids to school, or used to. Uh, therapeutic um, uh, radiopeptides, um, they've still uh, got the, the same structure. The target is still the somatostatin receptor. Uh, the one we use mostly is lutetium dotaroctreotate, which for, for simplicity we call lutate. Uh, the, the trade name will be lutathera. Uh, but there are other ones. You can, we, we started with indium-111 octreotide, uh, which is the octrea scan. You just give a, a, a very large amount of that. Uh, or sometimes we use uh, this one, yttrium-90, and I'll talk a little bit about that as we go on, which is called octrea fair. So uh, this has been an overnight success, PRRT. I, I, I gave the first treatment in September 1996 at Peter Mac. Uh, back here, it was a very lonely world. Uh, then no one was interested in neuroendocrine tumours. Most doctors had never even heard of them. Uh, and we started doing it. And we had a little cottage industry going uh, <laughs> there <laughs> with indium ultra uh, You know, it was very good at controlling symptoms. 
it, 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 it had almost no responses in terms of tumour shrinkage. So it, w it was effective in a, in a very small subgroup of patients with uh, symptoms. Uh, but then uh, in 2005, we got access to um, uh, lutetium, uh, which was much more effective at killing cells. The particles are much more uh, uh, lethal to, to cells. And that became the industrial revolution. Uh, we, we can see the growth in the number of scans there. And uh, in the last little while, we've started to, to play around with the one-size-fits-all uh, um, uh, protocols, uh, which we call the, uh, the personalised era, uh, that we hope is something of the enlightenment. Uh, so it's got a long history uh, with us. Uh, we've always treated patients using what's called compassionate use criteria under the special access scheme for unproven therapies. It's still considered an unproven therapy despite 20 years uh, plus, 21 years now of uh, experience. Um, most of the patients had advanced disease and had failed multiple lines of therapy. And if you're going to make it tough for a therapy to prove itself, use it in someone who's failed everything else and progressed. Uh, it's a tough ask. Uh, and you're also going to get much more toxicity in those. So we, we gave ourselves a, a very tall challenge there. Um, and most of our patients would have been excluded from the kinds of trials that Sharon mentioned because they were too sick. Their, their, their renal function was too poor, their blood counts were too low, their, you know, all sorts of reasons why they wouldn't have been considered for treatment. The other thing that we realised pretty early on, uh, you need to keep the oncologists interested and in the game, but they can also uh, do uh, help us by sensitising cells to the effects of, of radiation. So we, we pioneered this, uh, what we call peptide receptor chemoradionuclei therapy, where we combine chemotherapy agents that sensitise cells to the effects of radiation uh, with the PRRT to, to try and enhance the DNA damage that's done to those cells. And this is where the patients come from uh, in, in Victoria and, and nearby uh, areas. You'd think, you know, obviously we'd have lots of patients from, from the Melbourne area, but we've, uh, when we started, patients came from all over Australia, and in fact, they've come from all over the world. Um, and we've never advertised this. Patients find their way to us uh, and, and come. Uh, and you can see that uh, there's, I think, Ben um, Lawrence was telling me that 46 patients have now come from New Zealand to, to Melbourne for, for treatment uh, over the years. But we've had patients from Canada, uh, from India, uh, we've got some from Singapore, I haven't got the map updated. Uh, but we're starting to get more and more and uh, there's a big interest uh, from here uh, to come across uh, to Australia because the cost of this therapy when it's introduced in Australia will be roughly eight times what it is uh, at Peter Mac. One of the, th the reasons that it, it's been so slow to grow is the lack of those phase three trials. And, the, and uh, doctors believe in this uh, hierarchy of evidence, um, uh, which starts with ideas and opinions, you get a uh, uh, case report and case series and a series of different levels. And these go by levels of evidence. This is level one, randomized controlled double blind trials where you don't know what you're getting, placebo or the active drug and they're considered the highest level of evidence. And like uh, the Great Pyramid of Chops, everyone wants a nice pointy top on, the, on, the, uh, on their pyramid. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, you know, we had to wait a long time to put that top on our evidence base. And so, like the Aztec, you know, this is where virgins and young men were, were uh, sacrificed in, in, in Central America. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of patients were sacrificed for the lack of randomised controlled trial data about uh, neuroendocrine tumours. But we did our best with what we had, uh, which was to get Kaplan-Meier curves, to look at survival. Uh, and uh, the thing that Sharon perhaps didn't point out is the thing we normally report is the median uh, survival, where 50% or medium event rate in here uh, at 50%, uh, and that's sort of used to compare you know, uh, how long half the patients have taken to get to that point. And uh, if we looked at our initial series of patients with lutate, the median survival was still not reached with the median follow-up of over five years. So we'd been following the patients for five years and still more than half the patients were alive at that point. Uh, if we look at that overall survival 
which is really an endpoint you can't argue with. Progression-free survival depends a little bit when you do the scan. And, and I think if you look at one of Sharon's, the clarinet study, there were these big drops at 12, 18 and 24 months. That's actually when they happened to have a scan. Uh, and they found that they'd progressed by that, that scan. Uh, so it's a little bit dependent on how often you do the scans, how quickly someone progresses. Uh, but here, overall survival, you know, you're, you're alive or you're dead. Uh, and you can see that these overall survivals are out five, six uh, years uh, in some of these, uh, in most of these series from a whole lot of different institutions around the world doing this kind of tri uh, trial. But more than that, we, we, we see individual patients. Those curves don't tell us about uh, the, the good, the bad, the indifferent in, in the therapy. This is, in fact, a hepatobiliary surgeon. Uh, who uh, ironically, or unfortunately for him, got uh, a uh, extensive pancreatic uh, neuroendocrine tumour with extensive infiltration of his liver, and that was in 2009. And you can see during the course of, uh, of his treatment, the, the target that we were um, aiming for with the PRRT has progressively uh, diminished, and he's, he's still alive in his 80s uh, in, in 2017. But this was the end, not the beginning, of, of his uh, therapies. He had somatostatin analogue therapy with a good response in his chromogranular level, then changed over to the second line uh, somatostatin analogue lanreotide, again with a temporary response, and then got chemotherapy with a short-lived response. And then his PRRT, really durable response. So they tried everything. Uh, does it control symptoms? The answer is yes, it does. You know, this is a patient with an insulinoma who was in intensive care on 50% glucose infusion, lots of drugs, very poor performance status. The ECOG uh, is, is a measure. E ECOG 4 is just bloody near dead. 5 is dead. <laughs> 4 is bloody near dead. Uh, so he, 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 was, he was doing very badly. And this, this is um, him... Um, uh, less than a year later, normal insulin levels in an outpatient off all medications with a normal performance status. And again, he's in his 80s and he's still alive and well. Uh, does it happen quickly? It doesn't. It can happen really slowly. This is a patient who uh, came to us in February 2008, wheel wheelchair bound because she had um, uh, impending spinal cord um, uh, compression. Uh, from one of these uh, deposits up here. And uh, in 2013, you can see this gradual reduction in the, um, uh, the number and intensity of uptake. And she's still, again, alive and well in 2017. One of the things that we got accused of was, well, you're just selecting the good players, the people who are going to do well because they've got somatostatin receptors. <coughs> you know, you're not choosing the bad guys. Well, in fact, we did choose all the bad guys. Uh, a third of them in our initial series had FDG uptake. Um, almost a half of them were in the G2. That's the intermediate grade, not in the low grade. If you looked at the clarinet study or the, the ProMed study, the vast majority of them were in the class one, the grade one, the low grade tumours. Uh, so we, we, did, we chose relatively bad people uh, in terms of, of their outlook. And yet our overall survival we still hadn't reached. I showed you that progression-free survival is around four years. That's how long it took to need another therapy in, in, on average for patients. That's a long time. And if we look at something called a, a waterfall plot, this is something that Sharon didn't introduce you to. It's looking at how much you get reduction in a scan or increase in the scan o over what it was at the beginning. And this is a waterfall plot in the group of patients who were positive on the FDG scan. They're the bad group. And you can see this. Uh, the vast majority of patients are below the line. The nature of, of that disease is to grow. And the fact that most of the, the follow-up scans are below the line uh, suggests a very good outcome. But of course, it doesn't work in everyone. Here's a patient who progressed quite dramatically uh, after, after treatment, despite having the target there. And most of them. Uh, uh, had very good responses also on the FDG. If we compare it, and we can't compare it because they're not in parallel arms, they're not in, entirely uh, the same patients, but if we just look at 
the published trials, randomised controlled trials. This is the Everol and this one that uh, Sharon showed you. Median progression-free survival was 11 months. Uh, the other one, uh, uh, which is the Sunitinib trial, showed a um, progression-free survival of 11 months. Right? Uh, this is the chemotherapy that's currently available in uh, New Zealand, widely used, median progression-free survival of 18 months. Uh, this is our trial in the FDG AVID. They're the worst prognosis group, 48 months progression-free survival. We think it's, it's pretty encouraging. And if we look at data uh, where people looked at people, uh, patients who had both FDG AVID uh, and uh, somatostatin uh, avid disease. This is the progression-free survival here, and this is the overall survival, which is where both somatostatin receptor and FDG are positive. You can see the progression-free survival was about 19 months with best care available. So we're more than twice that um, uh, in, in terms of our outcomes. But we now have a cap on the pyramid we have a randomised control trial uh, of sorts because it's only in mid-gut, small bowel, neurointestinal, uh, gastrointestinal tumours, uh, and it wasn't compared to a placebo. Most of the other trials were against nothing. In this particular trial, the control arm was increased dose of somatostatin analogue. So if people had progressed on uh, somatostatin LAR at the conventional dose of, of um, 40 milligrams, which is actually higher than many people are already on, they were bumped up to, to 60 milligrams, which many people think is probably an effective therapy in its own right uh, uh, in controlling progression. But if you look at these curves, uh, there's a, a common joke that um, uh, clinically significant um, uh, difference in these Kaplan-Meier curves is being able to keep the cursor between the lines when you're nervous. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I can do that <laughs> on, on these curves. They're pretty dramatically different. And this is, this is progression-free survival, and th this is overall survival. Uh, and they still haven't reached it yet, uh, but the curves are getting well and truly uh, apart. And unfortunately, none of this actually tells you about the, the, the impact that NET has on human suffering and the cost to individuals and families and the communities. They're just about life and death. They're, they're, they're very hard endpoints. They, they, they lack the subtlety. Um, next fact, PRT suitability is determined by imaging. I've shown you that. Uh, that PRT has no role in aggressive disease. Well, this is an anecdote, a case report, if you like. Uh, the lowest level of evidence, but it's hard to argue that this patient didn't benefit from having PRRT. They're the before and after pictures. Liver full of tumour, large pancreatic tumour, uh, had a, a, a one of these quite aggressive uh, G3 neuron con, um, pancreatic neuron concussive in 2013. Uh, and this is his picture from January this year, uh, his Gatate scan, and you can see uh, that he has only a tiny little nubbin of tissue there. Four years down the track with probably the worst prognosis, but even more impressive than that, that was his FDG scan at baseline in 2013, and after three cycles of chemotherapy, he'd progressed. Had the most aggressive chemotherapy, and he'd progressed on, on that. And his scan was normal by March 2014, and has remained completely normal since then. This is. Uh, another patient, and because uh, we're getting such good response in these patients, we've moved to using this as a first-line treatment uh, in some patients. Uh, this patient was unsuitable for chemotherapy uh, because of low uh, platelet counts, uh, so we gave her, her um, treatment with this alone. This is a pretty impressive scan. This is the tumour uh, invading into the main vein that drains from the spleen into the liver, and this is the main vein that goes down uh, to supply the gut, so it invaded the vessels uh, in, in, uh, going through her liver. Uh, she was again had a, a key 67 of 50%. She's actually a GP, uh, and, and she, she was rather depressed about this, uh, not surprisingly. Um, but there, her s first uh, three scans during treatment, after first cycle, after second cycle, after third cycle, 
and she felt, felt so well. Uh, she read the literature and she came back, she said, uh, I don't want to have the third one right now. I'd like to go home and visit my family in France before I die. Uh, and because she felt so well, which so she went home. Uh, but she didn't die. Um, and this is her scan in March 2017, uh, as best we can reckon it. She's not cured. She's got a little nubbin of tissue there in, in her pancreas, but pretty close. Uh, and we continue to watch her. Fact, disease bulk Im 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 impacts outcome. The bulkier your disease, the less likely it is to respond or the harder it is to try and treat it. Uh, we we um, looked at that uh, in our initial series and found that any deposit more than five centimetres was much less likely to respond than, than uh, deposits less than that. Uh, and so uh, Grace Kong, who works with me, we set up a protocol to use um, the, a more energetic particle, one that goes further in tissue. Uh, and to, to explain that, uh, here's a, a cluster of cells. The indium, which was the first one we started, uh, goes only one or two cells maximum diameter. And so unless every cell in the, in the lump has that target, it's not going to get effectively treated. The uh, yttrium is a very long one. It goes about 12 millimetres, which is thousands of cells in each direction. Uh, the, the one we, I've shown you most of the pictures of is lutetium. That goes about two millimetres. And so that gives very dense radiation internally, but not very much around the outside. And to explain how that varies when your deposits get bigger and smaller, if we have a one centimetre deposit and we use lutetium, about 10% of the radiation is outside the sphere. For a big deposit, it's about 2% outside the sphere. It's very low percentage, so the collateral damage, if you like, to normal cells is very low. However, if you use yttrium, uh, it goes further. And if you have a small deposit, 60% of the radiation is actually outside the deposit. That's even with a one centimetre deposit. If you have five millimetre deposits closer to 90%, and one cell, it's close to 100%. So it gets almost no radiation. Uh, but the big ones, uh, we, we, we still get um, a reasonable amount outside, but most of it inside. And so it's a much better uh, uh, approach for these big ones. And so we've uh, developed a protocol to start with the, the, the yttrium and then move to the, to the lutetium uh, as the tumours shrink. And so this is a patient with very bulky disease. You can see large deposits here in the liver, uh, here. Uh, and that with uh, the treatment, not only do they get smaller, uh, they get less intense. And uh, we move on to the lutetium in those. And when we look at the outcome of these patients, the overall survival in this group is even better, uh, even though they're the worst of, of all players in terms of the bulkiness of the disease. We've got marked tumour shrinkage, marked reduce, reduction in pet tumour volume, uh, and very good overall survival in these patients. Last fact. How are we going? All right. Um, quality of life is important. Uh, I think you all know that. Uh, the fiction is that no one's cured of this disease. I've, I've spent a lot of time telling you that, that, that you don't get cured. Most people die of it, but there are cures. And this, this is uh, an example. Uh, this is a 17-year-old girl that came, came to us in 2006. That's her FDG scan, unequivocally bad. Uh, after PRRT uh, in 2012, uh, which was um, uh, a, uh, the last time that we treated her. She had tiny little bit of disease. 2014, we couldn't see anything. And we've repeated her scan earlier this year and it's still normal. You can see on a chromogranin levels, high levels came down, had some relapse, retreated, a couple of retreatments. Her last treatment was in 2009. And as far as we can tell, she's, she's probably cured. And, uh, the last well, a couple of years ago when we, we'd had four years of follow-up, uh, uh, she said, oh, shit, I'm going to have to get a job. Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> she'd been living to die. You know, she'd be going, you know, gap year <laughs> after gap year, uh, <laughs> permanent gap year, and then she decided she'd have to get a job. And she's, she's now working, and she's very good. Uh, here's another patient um, uh, with um, uh, very extensive disease in the liver and pancreas who, after treatment, 
had a very small nubbin of tissue left in the pancreas uh, that was uh, resected and she is now five years out from that, that surgery uh, and uh, as far as we can reckon probably cured. Uh, but why do some patients respond so well? We don't know. We'd like to bottle them. And this is one of the things we're working with uh, our, our colleagues here in, in Auckland to try and understand the extreme response. This is a, a patient from New Zealand. Again, unequivocally bad starting point. Lots of um, glucose used by the tumour in the liver, extensive infiltration of the liver. The GAT8 scan looks even worse. Whole liver almost involved. This is the scan after cycle one, after cycle two, after cycle three and cycle four. And this is her scan three months after completion of four cycles of treatment. Again, as best we can reckon it, that there's little or no tumour left in any of those sites of disease. And the chromogranin levels, I know you all have chromogranin en envy. Has anyone ever seen a chromogranin of 120,000? I haven't. That, that's the highest I've ever seen. Uh, I didn't know they can measure it that high, in fact. There's a very, very diligent diluters here in, uh, in Auckland. <laughs> uh, it went to 140, uh, and you can see now that the, this is 66. Uh, and the normal range up to 102, so it's now in the normal range. Pretty remarkable. But why? I have no idea why this patient responded so well, uh, um, so quickly. Um, but we're, we're trying to find out, and if we can find out the genes or the genes that, that do this, often we can make drugs that can knock out that gene or the, the gene protein and help us to do that. I've shown you a lot of pretty pictures, but how do we judge success? Uh, I, I judge it by the stories that patients tell me. Uh, that girl that I showed you her pictures, she was 17 year old, she had a hormone secreting tumour that gave her acne, lost her hair and put on weight, um, masculinising hormones. And she, you know, with treatment that all went away and she was able to go to her, her, uh, her formal looking gorgeous. Had a 25 year old uh, man who had uh, bleeding gastric ulcers, <coughs> so he couldn't work. Uh, and um, uh, he, he got treated, actually the second patient we treated with Lutec. Um, I couldn't get him back for a scan because he was so well. His, his um, uh, indigestion, bleeding ulcers went away. He went back to India and set up a company uh, that uh, he was making too much money. He, he said, I'm too busy to come back for a scan. Uh, a 40 year old who, who gained 25 um, uh, kilograms um, and, and felt so well that he decided to start a family. Uh, he uh, was on his second marriage uh, and his wife desperately wanted kids and uh, he knew his outlook was, was poor um, but she wanted kids so they, they started the family, had two beautiful children uh, and unfortunately his, his wife died of melanoma uh, about two years before he did. Uh, but he lived to see his children grow up to, to be, uh, I treated him for 12 years uh, uh, during, during that, uh, that time. And uh, his kids are now settled with their aunt and uncle and extremely happy and they, that they got to, to live firstly and they got to know their dad. Uh, a 59 year old uh, patient who was lying in bed fecally incontinent um, um, so, so severely affected by something her tumour was, was secreting that she became, <coughs> excuse me, uh, fully functional in the community. Uh, an actress who won a, an award um, after uh, going back to the stage, feeling the best she had in, in seven years. Um, <coughs> uh, another patient who I looked after for uh, over 12 years had 18 doses of therapy and he saw not only his kids finish school, go to university, but graduate and they have children of their own and then being the, the coach of his grandson's Australian Royals footy team. I went to his funeral uh, and saw the slideshow, which was most of the rest of his life, you know, after his diagnosis because they decided to capture it and he lived a, a, a really good life. And, uh, a 50 year old cardiologist, I don't know if he's 50 years old now, <laughs> who, who rode the Tour de France. And these, these, these are his pictures, uh, pretty awful, 
I'm sorry to say now, <laughs> I didn't tell him at the time, uh, but it, I, I didn't hold great, great hopes because he had quite a few areas of, of uh, uh, FDG avid disease and that was him in 2014. And his scans look pretty much the same or better uh, now. And there he is on the Col de Glubier and the Tour de France and he also uh, in support of the Unicorn Foundation and a great supporter of Unicorn Foundation here in New Zealand rode the South Island uh, uh, recently so it, it, that, that's what I, I, I count as being important. This is a Kiwi friend that some of you will know we lost. Uh, uh, Andre Martin uh, was on Grand Design uh, and uh, he built his dream home. Uh, he touched the lives of many and he lived long enough uh, for his daughter to know him. I mean, when, when he was diagnosed, she was two. When he died, she was seven. And, and she will um, remember her dad. Um, th this, is, this is sort of the, the beauty of functional imaging. You can put someone's life history on, on one, one page and you can see here's a patient with extensive disease, great response to treatment, came back, uh, a little bit, gave him some more treatment, went away, came back, poorer response to treatment. Eventually he died in, in 2016. But in that time, he, he sent me a travel log of photos of where he'd been. It's San Susi in Potsdam, uh, without care. This is Botswana. Uh, and uh, he said to me, I knew the destination, but I preferred the donkey trail. <laughs> so thank you, uh, Unicorn Foundation, uh, and my team at Peter Mac, and th this is a little bit of pot of philosophy from uh, a couple of thousand years ago. And I'd encourage you all to live your lives, <coughs> embrace the opportunities that you have, uh, good, bad or indifferent, uh, we're all going to die. Thank you. Thank you.